Good afternoon, everybody. This morning, we started with a lot of AI talks. Uh, I'm going to bring you back to HPC, full precision. I'm Karthik. I am a high-performance computing engineer at ExxonMobil. My friends, mostly non-HPC engineers, think that most of the things that I do involve taking a sequential code and parallelizing it and trying to optimize algorithms to squeeze the last bit of performance out of the supercomputer cluster that I work on. That is partly true. But there is more to being an HPC engineer than just optimizing algorithms and parallelizing sequential algorithms. And that is a topic I'm going to talk about. And that is proving that in the process of parallelizing algorithms, I have not changed results. And that the ones who have originally developed the algorithms still trust the parallel version as much as they trust the sequential version. So today I'm going to talk about a technique that we sort of discovered which will help us validate code, especially after uh, software has been upgraded. This is a work that four of us developer at, uh, developers at ExxonMobil, myself, Yongchang Ji, Kirsten Byers, James, all of who are there in the audience today, did with a lot of guidance from our mentor, uh, Rahul Sampath. We got a lot of support from the subsurface imaging uh, team at ExxonMobil and as well as uh, the HPC systems team. Some of you who were at this conference last year got a chance to listen to my friend uh, Steve Mariani talk about ExxonMobil's journey from CPUs to GPUs. 2022 was an exciting time for us, and we got our first GPU cluster. So all of us developers were mighty excited because we were now porting our CPU heavy code to GPUs. We also knew that a migration of this magnitude would come with a big validation effort because we would then have to prove to our research counterparts that we didn't break anything in the process of migrating from CPUs to GPUs. What we weren't really prepared for was how much floating point precision would come to bite us in this whole validation effort. So this talk, I'm going to start by reminding you all, and that's going to be pretty basic, about the precision of floating point arithmetics. I'm going to talk about how that is relevant in seismic processing applications. I'm also going to talk about the impact of the ever-changing HPC landscape on algorithms which incorporate floating point numbers. And finally, I'm going to talk about our validation journey itself. So I'm going to start with some basics. And this is going to be very, very basic. Floating point arithmetic. There are many jokes about the accuracy, or should I say the lack of accuracy of floating point arithmetic on computers. Let's take a look at this one here, the last one. 0 0.1 is a very easy number to represent on a piece of paper. But computers cannot represent 0 0.1 well, because unfortunately 0 0.1 is not a series of powers of 2, which means that it has an infinite representation on computers. And we don't have infinite memory, which means that we have to represent it using finite digits and introduce round off. And based on how we introduce round offs, there are two types of floating point numbers, the most famous ones, 32 bit and 64 bit, which I'm going to call FP32 and FP64 from now on. So on the left hand side, I'm doing a bunch of operations with FP32. And on the right hand side, I'm doing a bunch of operations with the 64 bit double precision FP64. So I take 0 0.36 and 0 0.17, two very easy numbers, and add them. And if I do that with FP32, I get it precisely up to about six to nine digits based on the, the architecture you are on. And in FP64, I get it accurate up to 16 digits. The message here is neither FP32 nor FP64 are perfectly accurate, but FP64 has more digits of precision. That's just one operation. Now, in the algorithms that we use, we do these iteratively. So if I were to do 100 iterations of additions and multiplications, I start accumulating error. And it's interesting to note that there is error in both FP32 and FP64 just that FP64 has more digits of precision, which means this feels more like machine precision to our customers. This, not so much. And when I do 100,000 iterations, 
suddenly this relative error seems very large to our customers, this doesn't seem so. But the important point, FP32 and FP64, neither of them are accurate. Just that FP64 has more digits of precision. This is just one part of the equation. The beast which bites us the most when we are optimizing algorithms is this, order of operations. We know that addition and multiplication, these are mathematically associative, commutative, distributive. Unfortunately, floating point arithmetic does not guarantee you this. And I'm gonna show that to you with an example here. What I wanna do here is add 990 and 1.1 1 .1 100 times. I'm doing it in two different ways. In the first case, I take 990 and then add 1.1 1 .1 to it 100 times. And in the second case, I start with 1.1, which is being added 100 times, and then eventually add 990. I'm doing all of this in FP32. The results, not the same. This is particularly important for us because changing order of operation is something that we do a lot when we are optimizing algorithms. Here is a oversimplified example of something that we did when we went from CPUs to GPUs. Oversimplified, do not read a lot into it. It's just an illustrative example. So I have a bunch of starting points here. What I want to do is I want to calculate ST at let's say eight different points. In one implementation, I am calculating one value of ST completely per iteration. And here, I am doing partial additions to ST for three different ST values per iteration. Mathematically, they are identical, but the order of operations are different and if I do this in FP32, the results are not identical, they're different. What is correct, what is wrong? Well, we do not know that for sure, but they're different, right? They, and, and they are not accurate exactly like how we would do it on a piece of paper. So order of operations matter, and if, when you do it in FP32, the results are different. When we do it in FP64, the double precision, full precision mode, the results are still slightly different at some points, but it's much less different than FP32. So here's FP32, the results are more different. Here is FP64, the results are different, but only slightly so much. So order of operations matter a lot, and when we optimize the code, when we go from one platform to another, we generally tend to change order of operations. It becomes really difficult for us to control order of operations. How is this relevant to us in seismic processing applications? Here are two images. These two images have been produced with the same algorithm and the same starting point. And by now you know that I've run one algorithm in FP64 bit mode and the other one in FP32 mode. If you look at this, it looks similar. It looks very, very similar, which is why I need a diffing tool. Otherwise I can't see what the difference is. And the moment I take it to a diffing tool, there is clearly a difference and in everyday parlance, we say that this is about 0.1% or 1e minus 3, 10 to the minus 3 different. So these results are different. Which is more correct? We don't know. But these results are different. So the left one here, this was run with the 64-bit mode and this was run in the 32-bit mode. And just by changing the type of floating point number, we start to see differences. This is particularly of concern to our stakeholders because the consumers of seismic images, which are produced by the seismic processing applications, they are seismic interpreters, and seismic interpreters generally, in our shop at least, like to work with about one to five percent of uncertainty. Just by changing the type of floating point number, we are introducing about 0.1 percent uncertainty, and this is worrisome to a lot of our stakeholders. I've been talking to for about eight minutes now, and I've been telling you that FP64 is better than FP32. Why do we have our algorithms in FP32 mode? Why can't we just go change everything to FP64 bit mode? The answer to that, unfortunately, is economics. So, most of seismic processing applications are both computationally intensive, and they are also IO intensive. That means they're doing a lot of computational operations and they are also doing a lot of reading and writing. For once, let's assume that we have an algorithm which is just computationally intensive, no I.O. happening. This takes an input, does a lot of arithmetic operations and then writes an output at the end of it. Let's assume there is no I.O. operations happening in between. Even an algorithm like that, in our case, 
is about 1.8 times more expensive when we go to the 64-bit mode compared to the 32-bit mode. And now add I.O. operations to it, and the algorithm becomes about 2.3 times more expensive. This is not acceptable because seismic processing applications are already very time consuming. Something that produces a result in 30 days would take about 70 days to give the same result, and this is not at all acceptable to our stakeholders, which means that our production code has to be in FP32 bit mode. So after all of this discussion, you might be wondering, okay, you have to do FP32 bit mode, and every time you do a, a, a porting from one, uh, one platform to another, one hardware to another, we have to do a validation. How often do you do this? Well, it's not every day that you buy a new GPU cluster. It's not every day that you change architecture. We buy a new supercomputer every four years, five years, six years. Why are you crying about something that you'll be doing once in every four or five years? The reality is the HPC landscape, especially with the onset of AI, is ever-changing. We are changing so fast that even though we're buying a hardware every four or five years, we are changing a lot of things much more often than that. We take compiler upgrades, we take OS upgrades, we change libraries. And what happens when all of these things change? Mostly, when these things change, they change some compiler instructions and change order of operations. When order of operations change, we know that FP32 is very sensitive to that, and results change, and we software developers are not sure if we broke something in the process of upgrading, or is this precision? because we have been starting to see precision differences at the level of 0.1%, 0.01%, which for all practical purposes feels like there is a bug in our code. So almost all of the differences that we see starts getting to be labeled as bugs, and then we go on this wild goose chase trying to figure out where is this bug, and eventually we feel, okay, precision is what is causing this difference, but there is no real way of being certain that precision is causing this difference. At this point, you might be wondering, end of the day, all of these seismic processing applications are numerical algorithms, and there are standard validation processes for ascertaining the results of, of numerical algorithms. But that is true. I'm going to, again, oversimplify and assume that I have an algorithm, and I know the analytical solution to this algorithm, which I've represented using the green dot here. And the yellow circles, uh, the yellow dots here, are the results that I get out of my algorithm each time I do an upgrade. And the blue circle is the threshold that is acceptable to me. If I knew the green circle, the green dot rather, and the blue circle, then after every upgrade, I don't have to spend a lot of time. If all my results live within the blue circle, I'm happy. I'm happy because it's all within the threshold. And I can say that, OK, with the upgrade, the results have changed. But this is within your acceptable threshold. This is true if your algorithms have an analytical solution. And in our case, the algorithms which have analytical solutions are very simple physics and mostly 2D. In reality, we are doing complex physics, 3D and sometimes 4D. The reality is there is no green circle, there is no blue circle, which means we do not know what the analytical solution is. We do not know what the threshold that is acceptable to us is. And so for a given hardware which was available at the time when an algorithm was developed, Someone does the hard work of validating the result, and that becomes our ground reality. And we are trying to match to this ground reality with every upgrade. If this is the situation where we are in, we are extremely happy because the results have changed ever so slightly, and everybody is ready to say, OK, we're going to change the benchmark from here to here to here to here, and these become our new benchmarks. What we've seen over the years is with the kind of changes that are happening to the HPC landscape, our results are changing like this. And our stakeholders are not certain about whether there are bugs in the code or whether this is just precision. And we are spending multiple hours, days, weeks, sometimes months, just trying to convince our stakeholders that in the process of upgrades, we've not introduced any bugs, and these are just precision differences. So going back to what I, what I would tell my friend when he would say that all that you do is take a serial code and parallelize it, I say, well, we do much more than that. We, see, we take a serial code, parallelize this, and then spend months convincing the one who wrote the serial code that I didn't break your code. So what do we do? 
I cannot use 64-bit precision in production. I have to use 32-bit because seismic processing algorithms are so expensive. But 32-bit is super sensitive. I change something and then round off errors are at 1e, negative 3, negative 4 levels, which are not acceptable. And this is where we took a lot of inspiration from conventional scientific applications, which are all running in FP64-bit mode, and said, OK, production code cannot be in FP64-bit mode. Can I have validation code in FP64-bit mode? Because I'm anyway spending months trying to validate the code. I do not mind running my algorithms just for validating for a little longer. So we decided that we are going to validate everything in the FP64-bit mode. So now I have two versions of the code base. One version does everything in the FP64-bit mode. One does everything in the 32-bit mode, which is the production one. And if in the FP64-bit mode, the differences pre-upgrade and post-upgrade are small, and, and by small I mean if it's 1e negative 7, negative 8 levels, then we can ascertain ourselves that there are no bugs in the code, and even if differences show at 1e negative 3, negative 4 level, in the FP32-bit mode, we can say that there are no bugs in our code, or no new bugs have been introduced after the upgrade, and we can then tell our stakeholders, you have made a choice to live with FP32 because you want fast results. That's going to change the results so much. Is it acceptable? If it's not acceptable, then we will go and find what these precision differences are. But then we're not chasing bugs. We are chasing precision differences. This gives us software developers more confidence that we did not introduce bugs. But this also brings in a new challenge to us software engineers, which is maintenance. Because what I said was, I'm going to have two versions of the code base, one in the 32-bit mode, one in the 64-bit mode. I don't want to maintain two versions of the code base. This is an easier problem than the first one, because we software engineers know how to maintain versions of the code base without having two copies. Templating is one classic example, but we don't like templates, because templates will ruin optimizations. Compilers go crazy when there is templatization. And also, I don't like reading code which is full of templates. It makes me, it makes it very hard to understand what are we trying to do with templates. So we took this inspiration from Petsy. So Petsy has data type agnostic code base, where we introduce something called real type. Our, our code base is full of real types instead of floats and doubles. And this real type is a type def which can be defined at compile time. By default, real type is float. And for validation purposes, I can pass in a flag and change real type to double, and I can do all of my dub, all of my validation in double mode. So this way, I can be sure that I, my production code is still running in FP32-bit mode, but my validation happens in a higher precision mode, and I can be sure that the code is devoid of any new bugs. So in conclusion, Large iterative numerical algorithms, which is what is the fund fundamental piece in seismic processing. Well, these are very, very sensitive to round off errors, especially if you're using 32 bit mode. The round off errors, what we've seen, is generally much larger than the so called machine precision levels. And there is no easy way for us developers to figure out whether the code has a bug or whether the differences after an upgrade are coming because of precision differences. There's no way that we can run 64-bit mode in production because it makes the algorithm so much more expensive and we are trying to reduce time as much as possible. But we can definitely run validation code in the FP64-bit mode and convince ourselves that there are no bugs and that all of the differences after the upgrade is because of precision. And then if necessary, we can go chasing these things in the name of precision-induced errors and not as bugs. There I rest my case. Precision is quite a big challenge for us in seismic processing. There, I did it in 17 minutes, so there are questions. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. I really liked it. Um, so I've got a question about what you do for basically production. So what do you do with the normal numbers? Do you, the normal numbers, do you know about the normal numbers? So like they are 
Oh, like they're without no any numbers that you can't like they are so small that you can't even represent them with a single. Uh, so we so generally uh, scale our code. So generally we have large numbers like your moduli tend to be very large and then strains tend to be very small. So we scale them up generally to have like a single, you know, like one into 10 in a scientific notation, one into 10 to the negative eight and one into 10 to the eight instead of having very large numbers and very small numbers. Is this what you're asking? Really, but maybe we can take that offline. Yeah, I, I don't know about you know very small numbers. In, in our context, I've not seen very, very small numbers that can't be represented, I'm sorry. Usually you get them when you are solving ways. Some compilers just decide to flush them to zero. They say, okay, this is too small, okay, I'm just going to replace it with zero. So you can play with compiler options to rather preserve them. So then your code is going to run a bit slower, but you get higher precision. I think we have already ha we already have that in the code, and this is despite that. So I'm pretty sure we don't we we have those compiler flags on which do not you know like round those very small numbers to zero. I'm asking because I played with that for quite some time because uh, they can make an impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll go back and see. Thank you, thank you again. Much.